The next person we have um, to present is Evan Abramson, whose uh, talk is called Pollinate Now, Bioregional Strategy for Habitat Restoration in the Hudson River Estuary Watershed. <laughs> My name's Evan Abramson. Um, I'm a landscape planner and designer, not a scientist, but I work with scientists. And this project is, um, it's about what we consider to be the largest pollinator corridor plan in the United States. It's um, a bioregional strategy to address habitat decline, decline of wild pollinator species and loss of habitat uh, at the watershed scale. So um, I'll just go ahead here. I like to start, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but you know where we live right now, what's going on on the planet, we're living in the age of the Anthropocene. And I always start my presentations with this to remind people that as many as 30 to 50% of all species on the planet are heading toward extinction by the middle of the century. Uh, what this essentially means is a collapse of nature with over 25% of the native bee species in North America threatened with extinction globally. As you all know, insects are essential for all ecosystems, not only as pollinators, but also as food brother creatures and recyclers of nutrients. And the most uh, cited reason for the decline of wild insects is habitat loss. So according to one scientist, we are sleepwalking towards the edge of a cliff. Um, our sort of philosophy at my company, Landscape Interactions, is that our opportunities are in the places where the habitat is missing or where the habitat quality is low. So we do what we call designing nature. And we look at farms, conservation properties, urban and suburban green spaces, or even you know small front yards or sidewalk strips, rural communities, and even large scale solar arrays. Those are the opportunities for expanding regional biodiversity, resilience to climate change, as well as ecological health and even food security. Because what happens at the pollination scale affects um, the whole food web. Um, I probably don't have to mention this at all, but you know the importance of native pollinators in uh, food production is also important to mention, and bumblebees uh, being uh, the only genus that pollinates all major food crops. Um, regarding honeybees versus native bees, we focus our efforts on native bees, and particularly native bees that are at risk of local extinction or extirpation. And as you probably are aware, honeybees are negatively impact abundance of uh, most wild insects, most wild flying insects, including uh, bumblebees, solitary bees, hoverflies, march flies, and other flies, um, which is why we encourage people to not target honeybees if they're trying to help pollinators or quote unquote, save the bees, because it's basically like raising chickens to save the birds. Um, while most efforts to restore pollination systems have really focused on increasing the numbers of a few bee or butterfly species, um, and oftentimes based on their crop pollination abilities, we are really looking at the species that are known to be declining. And that's because of the delicate balance between particular species or genus and the plants that they visit. Um, a major misconception about pollinator decline is that all species are declining, or that all species should be saved. And in fact, seeing lots of bees in your pollinator garden or in your habitat does not necessarily mean that it's pollinator friendly. It might all be one or two species. So that's the difference between diversity and abundance. Where I'm based in Massachusetts, we've already lost two out of the most uh, common 11 bumblebee species. They're no longer found in the state and two other species are expected to be gone within the next decade. And in New York state where this project that I'm gonna be talking about today takes place, they found that between 38 and 60% of all native bees, uh, flies, beetles, and moths were um, at risk or already extirpated. And 25% of New York's bumblebee species are extirpated already. Um, this here on the right is a map of the Hudson River estuary watershed. At the bottom is New York City, uh, all of Manhattan, parts of Brooklyn, and Staten Island, and the Bronx. At the very top is Albany and Troy. And it goes all the way west to the foothills and even some of the higher elevation areas of the Catskills. So you can see from this uh, diagram, which comes from our work on the Palmy Now project, that in the last 21 years, most observations of bumblebee species in the entire Hudson River Estuary watershed were a single species. They were bumbus impatiens. 
And second to that would be species that are considered abundant or stable, such as Bumbus pericomus, Bameculatus, Flavidus, Griscolus, Perplexus, Rufinosanctus, and Sandersoni. The declining species, which are in black, those are the black dots, you barely see them. That's because there's been very few observations in the past 21 years, and that includes Borealis, Citrinus, Fervidus, Pennsylvanicus, Trinarius, Tricola, and Vagans. So, yes, in, the, in um, looking at historical versus contemporary bumblebee species observations in the Hudson Valley of New York, 62% of all contemporary bumblebee records are a single species, Bumbus and Patience. And you can see the differences here, uh, historical being in teal, contemporary being in gold, and just how much of a monoculture the landscape has really become. These um, circles with the images of the bees on the left are two scale. So the number of Bumbus and Patience observations compared to Vagans and Tricola is to scale on these images. At present, native plants are also in decline. 25% of native plant species in New York and New England have been lost in comparison to historical figures and non-native species have increased by about 20%. And as you, as many of you are probably aware, bird declines are also linked to non-native plants. A study done by Doug Tallamy and Desiree Naranjo found that in suburban yards in Washington, D.C., yards with less than 70% native plants were unable to sustain stable populations of Carolina chickadees. So it moves across trophic levels. What we do at the pollination scale benefits all wildlife. And animal and plant species diversity is ecological resiliency, which is really important now because we're facing so many disturbances due to climate change and other factors, whether it's flooding, drought, wildfires, or what have you. A diverse combination of plant and animal species in a community increases the likelihood that the loss of one species can be somewhat compensated by other species that might play a similar role in the ecosystem, such as a grassland environment or a woodland edge. So this, um, this here is the cover of our project, Pollinate Now. It's a 200 page PDF and you can download it for free on our website. I'll give you the link at the end. Um, as I mentioned, it's a, bio, it's a bioregional strategy. We looked at the entire Hudson River estuary watershed, which goes from Albany down to New York City. And then what we did was we picked four toolkit sites. Each of these sites represented a different type of landscape, urban, farmland, conservation, riparian. And each of them were present in a different sub watershed of the Hudson River estuary. So here, this map shows you the four toolkit sites. We had an urban residential site in Kingston, New York on the um, top left, a riparian site in Gardner, New York on the bottom left. Our farmland site and our conservation site were on the east side of the Hudson River. And each of them represents a different watershed that also is you know, depositing water into the, the Hudson. So as I mentioned, we have these four toolkit sites. And what we did on these toolkit sites was we first, before we did any designing or habitat changes, we surveyed each site four times across the 2022 growing season to, to determine which bees and butterflies were on each site and which plants they were interacting with. Um, then we created the designs and they are currently being implemented. And then we're going to track the changes after the designs are fully grown in and blooming. So that'll probably be in two to three years. This is the list of at-risk pollinators that were supported by this plan. Um, we had about 35 uh, or 40 species of bees, native bees, um, and about, no, I'm sorry, 70 species of native bees and about, um, gosh, I'm losing my mind here. 30 something species of butterflies and about 15 species of moths. The way that we determined which species were in decline is the New York State Natural Heritage Program published a statewide assessment of pollinators in 2022. So we were able to jump onto that and obtain their GIS data points and then clip them to the Hudson River estuary watershed. We also included species that were declining in Berkshire County, Massachusetts, because that's also part of the watershed. That helped to build our butterfly list because the New York, the Empire State Native Pollinator Survey did not include butterflies, but included many different taxa of bees, flies, beetles, and moths. Um, we have a pretty comprehensive plant list for the project. 
It's about 150 species of native plants, everything from trees like maples down to the smallest um, shade tolerant flowers. And for each species, we are providing a range of information, including their habitat conditions, their height, their spread, as well as whether they provide pollen, nectar, or host plant material, and whether they support at-risk bumblebees, other at-risk bees, butterflies, or moths. Um, we also found in analyzing our data and the plant list that um, certain plant genus or species stood out as supporting more at-risk species than others. And so we have a list here of the top 18 um, plant groups that support the most of the 70 at-risk species, which included uh, native rubus, native salix, native prunus, and many other species, uh, and many other genus, spirea, dogbane, roses, et cetera. Um, our baseline survey results, as I mentioned, we surveyed each of the four sites before any habitat changes occurred. Those were done by Molly Jacobson at SUNY ESF in New York. And we found overall in analyzing that data that target interactions with native species were extremely low, indicating significant pollination system degradation, which means that most of the plants that were supporting pollinators were non-native or most of the species that were on the site were not at risk or both in most cases. Um, a lot of honeybees and bumbus and patients so our first site, the riparian site, it's on the Walka River. Almost the entire site is within the 100-year floodplain. These images so, show recent flooding events. So we created a scalable, replicable riparian buffer design that would, would be meant to be um, implemented over time across the entire riverbank area on the property. Um, this is a, a look at the design. It includes, includes a mix of um, live stakes, trees and shrubs, as well as um, seed mixes for shade as well as sun, um, shrubs, flowers, grasses, sedges. It's a pretty long plant list. Um, so I'm not gonna go into the details there, but all appropriate for the conditions of the site and to prevent flooding and further damage of infrastructure. This section shows um, different historic flood events. So the top line is from 1955. The water was about 19.81 feet above the normal base flow. And then in 2007 and 2011, we had events that brought the water up to about 15 and 19 feet. And you can see the this is a look at what the riparian buffer design would look like after it's installed and how that would help prevent the flooding and absorb a lot of that water. Um, we also provide for each of the toolkit sites a management timeline, as well as site preparation and maintenance guidelines, including how to create bee nesting strips. Um, the urban and residential site was in Kingston, New York. It was largely non-native vegetation, if not invasive vegetation. Um, we created a series of different zones on the site that were diverse because of the conditions of the site. Some were full sun, some were in the parking lot, some were under complete shade, some were close to the road, some needed to be used by people for eating or outdoor recreation or gathering. And this is just a look at what one of those design areas would look like with a redbud tree in front of the building on the northeastern side of the building. We also created a planter that could support native grassland species that would have about a four foot deep um, soil system for the roots. So I'm gonna move forward a bit, but like I said, I'll give you guys the link to this at the end in case you wanna take a further look. Um, each site has specific seed mixes, plant lists, designs for different areas. We created a bee and butterfly lawn, so to replace a regular turf grass with all native sedges, grasses, and mow tolerant flowers. Um, our farmland site is at Bard College in Red Hook, New York. It was a 14 acre cornfield that was basically not in production and it was overrun by weeds and invasive species. So we really just did a reset and they're about to uh, seed it this fall after a full year of site preparation. It includes hedgerows, a scrub shrub wetland, a wet meadow, an upland meadow that's about 12 acres of seed, um, and a hilltop area. And this is the hilltop design with a series of different plants. Many of them are host plants, if not pollen or nectar plants. Pitch pine, beech plum, scrub oak, low bush blueberry, round leaf ragwort. This is a look at one of the hedgerows from the perspective of walking next to it. 
Um, I'd I normally like to go into the plant side more, but I feel the pressure of time. So I will continue. Our fourth site was the conservation toolkit site. It was a 200 acre site that had been sort of attempted to be turned into grazing lands for grass fed beef and the landowners decided they didn't want to raise cattle and they want to turn it into um, a native meadow and for ecological restoration. So we also looked at a pond on their site as well as the about a hundred acres of open fields. And we created these different areas that over time could be scaled and expanded across the entire site. So you can see here, there's a phasing schedule with phase one being core meadow areas with a mode path and a strip of meadow linking those areas, leading from the main areas of the property, the pond restoration and some hedgerows. One thing that was notable was that the owners had a lot of problems with jumping worms. And so they wanted their hedgerows that were not immediately next to where they already had jumping worms on their site to be bare root. And we actually were able to create a bare root hedgerow design. We reached out to dozens and dozens of nurseries across the Eastern and even the Midwestern United States and Southern Canada and found that quite a lot of native uh, plant availability um, can be found in bare root, which means that you can plant without a soil coming from the nursery and thereby reduce the risk of spreading invasive jumping worms. Um, and this is a look at our um, pond restoration area. It had several different zones going from, you know, a deeper water area that would maybe be six to 12 inches of water, things like pickerel weed would grow there to like a shallow pond area, things like native cranberry or wild rice, which is a host plant to the pond edge, to the pond path. And so in looking at an area and the different zones, the different, the different moisture levels, sun levels, you're able to really fit in a lot of diversity as far as the plants go. And we're able to do everything from trees and shrubs down to smaller um, grasses, sedges, and flowers, um, thereby providing the full range of needs for the um, at-risk species on our list. So maybe we have a bit of time. I'll just run through the plant list a so, little bit. Um, Evan. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm afraid that we've sort of we've run over our time just a little bit. Okay. So yeah, there's a lot of information in the plan. We also showed maps of how you could scale these designs across the watershed. This is an installation that occurred this week at Bard College. And um, over time, we like to improve the functional diversity of our sites. We use bumblebees and butterflies as a metric of success. So which bumblebee and butterfly species were on the site before and then after the plants are established. Um, here's the link where you can download the plan. Uh, fully illustrated. It's landscapeinteractions.com forward slash pollinate now. I apologize for going a bit over and I can take any questions that you have.